I love video games. I've played them since I was a kid, and I currently own in the ballpark of 500 on Steam. When it comes to reviews for games, though, I see some problems. First off, no one really reviews niche games, or at least only a handful of people do. And this can be a problem, since some of the best games I've ever played are that kind of niche. Underhero, Lisa, Titan Souls, just to name a few. The other problem I have is that a lot of times, games are talked about with no reference to their price point. I think it's reasonable to assume that a $60 game should give back four times the value of a $15 game. And if you're like me, buying games on sale is how you find yourself with about 90% of your library. Lastly, I think reviewers talk about issues and not examples of where they're solved. Even if you have a game I'm talking about, I think there's some merit in reflecting on its mistakes, and showing off games that get it right. So stick around even if that's the case. In this video, and maybe a following series of videos if people think this one's cool, I'll be talking about the games that I think are under the radar and whether or not they're worth the cost of admission. Are flaws still flaws if they're put there for a reason? Bear with me here. The intro is weird, but there's a point to it. The game Monopoly was created in 1903 by a lady named Lizzie Maggie, under the name The Landlord's Game. The game was meant to show the evils and issues with systems allowing monopolies to be formed, and in the modern version of Monopoly, there is an often cited problem that the game goes on way too long. However, this is put there as a metaphor for monopolies that, while not truly monopolies, still allow for one company to have total control over the industry, in this case, the board. This is a flaw in the game. No one likes this part of Monopoly, but it's there for a reason. And if it's there for a reason, is it really a flaw? The Sea Will Claim Everything is a 2016 point-and-click adventure game created by a German game designer named Jonas Kiratsis. Jonas was responsible for co-writing the Talos Principle and, I guess, working on Sirius Sam 4 in some capacity. The Sea Will Claim Everything takes place in the Land of Dream, a fictional set of islands essentially ruled by a man named Urizen. For those keen to it, yes, there is a lot of William Blake reflected not only in the game, but its creator. The game is an adventure game with light puzzle elements that plays as much like a novel as it does like a game. You're summoned by the mystical wizard known only as the... You're tasked with, above all else, healing Underhome, where the and Niam, his wife, live. You head across the aisles in search of Niam herself, as well as the solutions to Underhome's numerous issues, you know, clogged arteries, torn carpet, general stress, house problems. Um, before anything else, let's quick start with the music and visuals, um, because they aren't as important to the kind of central thesis of this game review essay, but they're both very quaint and pleasant parts of the game. There were a couple of places where I felt they could have changed the stills rather than removing the option to go there entirely. Uh, you can see this in Niamh's camp, the mayor's offices, etc. But overall, there's nothing wrong with the visuals, and the music is capital A awesome. The gameplay is the standard point-and-click fare, which is sometimes an infuriating standard, mind you. Um, you click on things to pick them up, and then you click on dialogue options to figure out what objects you have to click on. However, it is admittedly not quite that simple here. Some of the puzzles were super annoying in that point-and-click fashion, you know, the amulet in the first half of the game particularly really pissed me off when I figured out it was just clicking on a certain part of the screen. But for those kinds of infuriating puzzles, there are a couple that make you think in really, really interesting ways. For instance, the solution to the Cave of Horrors puzzle is one of the most creative I have ever seen in any game. It's not lacking in the way that a game like To the Moon is in cool solutions and agency. Speaking of which... Where this game shines the most is through its insane amount of dialogue, coupled with really interesting and fun characters. From the quiet fisherman on the Isle of the Stars, to the former pirate who runs the lighthouse on the Isle of the Moon. Every character is not only unique, but deeply constructed in a way which makes them feel incredibly real. But the real crazy thing about this game's writing is the quantity of it. Not that the game's quality lacks because of it, mind you, but everything has a unique description. Every flower, every mushroom, everything every vendor sells on every table, every background object, everything. It's impressive in the way that only a real labor of love can be, but boy does it serve to make some of those click-the-right-thing puzzles real annoying just by sheer volume of possibility. 
That being said, I think the very most important part about the writing isn't the characters or the quantity as much as it is about what it's trying to say. And this is where that Monopoly question comes into play. The game is incredibly political by nature, and it touches a lot of very interesting and sometimes incredibly existential questions through this political lens. Now, I will say right now that the game is not subtle, and it's totally aware of that. It kinda slaps you upside the head with its messaging, especially near the end of the narrative. Subtlety is seen as kind of the big important, especially in political narratives like this, but if its absence is in the name of the game's message, is that absence bad? In response to the issue of the game's lack of subtlety, Jonas wrote a really long article kind of describing the relationship between subtlety and narrative. I'll link it in the description, and I certainly can't do it a justice, but I think this particular line stood out to me as kind of one of the main points he was trying to make. Maybe sometimes subtle is a lie, because the truth is brutally simple. Maybe, in fact, sometimes subtle is just another word for cowardly. So, is the lack of subtlety a fact of the game? Yes. Is it perhaps even a flaw of the writing? Maybe, but I would be hard pressed to call it an issue of the game. The Sea Will Claim Everything is an absolutely beautiful game, with a narrative that brought me to tears and ideas and lessons that I'll carry with me long after I left the Lands of Dream. Would I suggest it to everyone? What? No, are you fucking kidding me? It's really weird and difficult to deal with sometimes, and very on the nose, but those qualities are what make it so fantastic. So, for the question of, is this game worth it? I'll have to give you two answers. If you heard what I said, and you're like, fuck yeah, this is exactly the kind of game I'm looking for, then it's worth a million times the $10 it costs. However, if you're skeptical, or you really feel like it wouldn't be your thing, I'd still actually probably suggest it on sale. Um, maybe pick it up for three or four bucks. The things it has to say are too interesting to pass up, and I wager everyone will at least get a little chuckle out of it, and if nothing else, a couple questions to reflect on. Now, what games would I suggest in its stead? Well, I think the first thing to suggest is some of Karatsas' other work, specifically some of his free flash stuff, like the Book of Living Magic or the Fabulous Screech. Now, if you're looking for something a little less, some um, revolutiony, socialist? Uh, if you're looking for something a little less, the sea will claim everything, but you're still looking for great characters and writing, look no further than to the moon. A game with its own issues, but none that it really shares with the sea will claim everything. Another great pick if you have a issue with the game's political nature is Doki Doki Literature Club. I, I swear to God. Despite a first hour that you just kind of have to power through, the game is again really fundamentally interesting and asks those big boy questions. Lastly, if you're looking for something political, but point-and-click isn't exactly your style, uh, I could probably suggest Little Inferno or Presentable Liberty. Now, they're not too different from point-and-click. They are certainly narrative-based. And I'm not going to go too into that narrative here because I think both of those games, like The Sea Will Claim Everything, are better to just kind of experience. But they definitely scratch a similar ideological itch.
thank you for sitting through this all the way uh, or clicking to the last 35 seconds. Um, and I promise I'll get back to vlogging soon if any of you are looking out for that because some interesting stuff has happened and I kind of can't wait to talk about it.